Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've had a, a chance to enjoy uh, the snacks uh, to get your level of energy back up. I just wanted to make a brief announcement before we start with the next session. I wanted to remind all of you that uh, at the end of the day today, there is a time for a networking hour followed by a dinner in Nathan Hale, right next door under the tent. So I absolutely invite all of you to come and attend that dinner as well as the social uh, from five and the dinner is at six. So please uh, come and join us uh, under the tent at Nathan Hale. And with this, I turn it over to uh, Jim, who will be your session chair. Yeah, we're live. <laughs> so our first speaker in this session is Ben Fuller. And uh, we've done some research together. We've done some other work together. He's come down to Comcast in Philadelphia and been a part of several other things. We've become friends. Um, he's an associate professor, professor in computer science here at UConn. Um, and he came from MIT and Lincoln Labs, and he was a research scientist at MIT up until 16, until UConn stole him away. And um, he received his PhD and master's from Boston University. And it's your turn. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so sorry, I'm gonna still be talking for a while. I know I've been kind of talking for the last couple of hours. Um, I'm going to talk on the more technical side now on something on how we can get authentication from parts of your body. Okay. And so this, this kind of ties in with this idea that we have more and more devices in our home, near us. I, I have a computer sitting in my pocket right here. I have another computer over there. I could probably have a computer on my watch. It's, it's really important now as we get more of these devices, we still have to authorize and authenticate users. And the more devices we have, the more important it is for this authentication to be transparent and, and still be secure. Because, right, the more devices I have, I don't know whose hands they're in. Okay? Um, and so there's a few different approaches to this, right? We, we all are familiar with passwords. We're all familiar with multi factor authentic authentication through using our phones. Jim earlier talked about some hardware solutions to this. So really what I want to focus on is, and I'm going to move ahead a little bit, um, is something called biometrics. So I assume we all have some exposure to this. So a biometric is a part of your body that is measured and authenticated by a com computer system. So it's designed to measure some unique physical phenomenon. So something about what makes me me. Presumably if, if I measure Jim, that thing should be different on the measurement of Jim than it is on me. Okay, so at the bottom here are some kind of classical examples of biometrics. Somebody's fingerprint, somebody's iris, somebody's hand geometry, their DNA. Okay, um, we want a biometric to be unique, um, which is different people shouldn't have the same fingerprint, should be collectible. We shouldn't have to, for example, draw blood to collect your DNA. That's really invasive. It's gonna keep it from ever being used in an internet scale computer system. Um, it should be permanent, right? Measuring something that constantly changes isn't very useful, and we also want it to, to work for all people, okay? If this is uh, a physical property that is only exhibited in one gender, in one race, in one ethnicity, it, again, we're not gonna be able to go up to internet scale with it, okay? One of the most important things about biometrics is that when I look at my fingerprint twice, when I when I do this, I, I try and log into my phone, it doesn't get the same reading of my fingerprint every time. There's a bunch of reasons for this. There's, there's sweat on my hand because I'm nervous, I'm talking in front of a room full of people, my hand's in a slightly different position, there's just sensor noise, there's a whole bunch of different sources of noise. And the, the last thing I wanna say about biometrics as a general source is that how unique they are and how much noise varies widely among biometrics, okay? I, I'm gonna make the claim that the iris is still considered to be the best. Um, it's seen some limited deployment 
um, in, in mobile devices, and the, the new iPhone is, is going to be doing facial geometry, which has a, as a component of it, it's using the iris as well. Okay. So when I want to use biometrics in, in a security protocol, the, the first thing I look at is we, we have some kid who, kids love social media, younger and younger, so this kid wants to use Facebook. And I'm sure kids don't use Facebook anymore, but I'm too old to know what two-year-olds use now, so let's assume that this kid uses Facebook. And so what it does is it takes a picture of its iris and it sends this to, to Facebook and says, Facebook, go ahead, you, you can store my initial value of my iris. And the way this authentication would work is now I have some final reading. And what I do is I, I say, Facebook, I want to log into my account. We should, we should talk to each other. And then Facebook's going to, to output an authentication decision. OK? So a couple of important things about this is that our, our user has to trust the st server to store an initial value. OK? It, it has to say, I'm, I'm OK, Facebook. You can have all my biometrics. You can have all the data you want on me. OK. The second thing is this kind of paradigm doesn't make a lot of sense if a user is authenticating to a device. OK? I can't have a conversation with a device. I can only really give it my value and say, authenticate me or not. OK? So kind of th this leads us for a lot of hardware platforms, which is where biometrics have seen most deployment, to we, we have a non-interactive thing. The, the phone has my initial reading. I just I send it my, my final reading, and it outputs an authentication decision. OK. Here, we still have this device storing my initial value. OK. And the way we authenticate is because there's noise in these values, we just check if the distance is, is smaller than some parameter. OK. I want to stress, though, that Everybody's phones here, or at least most people's phones, have their fingerprints in them. Not like, oh, some, some crypto. They have their fingerprints, right? If, if somebody really needed to, they could get your fingerprints off your phone. Furthermore, if your phone manufacturer really wanted to, they could take your fingerprints off your phone and use them to log into something else, OK? So what I want to talk about today is, is a privacy-preserving version of this. And so instead of just giving this initial value to my phone, I'm going to do some cryptographic operation and give this um, cryptographic operation to my phone instead. And what I want now is I want to be able to come up with a final reading and send this over to my phone when I'm, when I'm trying to log into it. And it can still do an authentication decision. Okay. So this is exactly like the same setting, except I don't have my phone storing my biometric. Okay. Um, instead, it's a, it's a cryptographic function of, of my biometric value. And what, what we're going to do in this talk is, is try and actually get a, a cryptographic key from, from my iris. Okay. So to give you a little bit of an idea how we do this, I want to introduce you to how iris processing works. I am not a machine vision person, so I apologize to the vision people in the room when I make one of like 20 mistakes I'm going to make here, but I'll, I'll do my best. OK. So this is roughly what an eye looks like. The, f the first thing we do when we want to say, oh, I want to identify somebody's iris, is we, we use contours to find the inner and outer radius of this iris. And so these are the, the red lines in the image here. We've said there's a bunch of things here that aren't the iris. They're the eyelids, the eyelashes, the sclera, um, and the, the pupil. Okay, And so we basically want to eliminate those. Um, and this just tells us what's actually the iris. The next thing we do is we take this, this radial image um, and we stitch it down to just a 2D vector. So you can. In this image, um, on the bottom left, you can actually see some of the eyelashes are still there. We just have um, pulled apart this iris. Um, and this is just using a, a polar transformation. Okay. And then the last thing we do is we convert, um, we use something called Gabor filters to get this down to ones and zeros in a bunch of positions. And how exactly this, this works isn't important. But we take this actual image and convert it to ones and zeros. Okay. And as I said, each bit of this array 
this final white and black array is subject to noise. Each bit flips with, with some probability. So the idea of how we're going to, rather than storing this array on our phone, we're gonna store a cryptographic function of it. So what we're gonna do, the idea is we're gonna come up with a, a random cryptographic key. Okay, we're gonna call this key because I'm not good at naming things. So we're gonna call our key key. And rather than storing any part of initial, what we're going to do is we have this initial value. When we wanna enroll, I wanna be able to output this key. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, rather than thinking about an image, I'm just gonna think about a vector. What I wanna do is I wanna encrypt my key with parts of this vector, okay? So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write down just some random parts of this vector, and I'm gonna think about locking my key using a, a hypothetical combination lock. I'm gonna put the same key inside of all of these, okay? So what I have is I have the, the true secret I care about is gonna go inside these combination locks um, and the combination for them is gonna be the parts of my biometric, okay? And so what I'm gonna store on my phone is actually these locked combination locks. And I'm gonna throw away what the, the combinations were and I'm just gonna keep um, where, where I read from the biometric. So rather than storing the, the whole biometric on the phone, what I just store is these combination locks along with these positions that I sampled from, okay? Um, and so when it comes time to uh, authenticate, I have these combination locks, I have this new reading, in red is where there were errors, um, and what I just do is I, I try and each, open each combination lock, and because I was the person who made these slides, one of these combination locks happens to open, um, and you get the key back out. And so you just go over these combination locks. Okay, so I, I know it's late in the afternoon, you've been listening for a while, and I just went through some crypto. And that's not the most fun and thing in the world to have after like six hours of talks. So what I wanna say now is, okay, like I wanna use this for the iris. Um, the nice thing about this is the crypto I just described allows me to, we're always told, never reuse passwords, different things in different places. I can safely enroll my biometric with as many different providers as I want using this construction. It's a really important property for, for scaling. Um, and so I wanna know, does, does this actually work? Um, we assume that we want this to open 50% of the time, which seems low, um, but we have, once, once we can open that much, it's actually not that hard to get uh, pretty high correctness out of it. Um, and we use some kind of standard techniques. So when we naively do this, um, the combinations we get only are allowed to be 32 bits. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't trust 30 bits of security. Um, that's not enough. So most of the actual technical work in making this work for the iris is about how we um, integrate this image processing as well as the cryptography. Um, I'm doing okay on time. So in particular, I, I told you about this uh, two-dimensional array that is converted down to this um, uh, Rorschach-looking picture here. What, what we notice is that this, this, this array was formed by a two-stage process. First, we, we run some filter that's a convolution, and then we quantize the output. And so what we observe is that, well, we can separate out these two phases. We can run this filter, look at the, the unquantized data, as well as the quantized data. And what we notice is that this unquantized data, the magnitude of it actually tells us about what error rate we're gonna see in the future. So uh, the pixels that are more red in this image are less likely to have an error in the future. And we can use this magnitude to actually guide how we uh, pick bits for this confidence uh, or for these combination locks um, and we actually get about a third of the error rate doing this. And this allows us to increase the size of our, our combination locks from 32 bits to, to 88, which is a lot more on the, well, one, it's, it's higher than passwords, and two, it's a lot more what you would call cryptographic strength, or at least approaching it. Um, so just to, to finish up, what we, we, we actually get is 
a system where we can derive stable keys from somebody's iris, okay? Um, and we have a, a provable lower bound of about 47 bits of security. Um, I expect security to be much higher in practice because these combination locks are, are 88 bits, but security people tend to be pessimistic, so I re report the lower one. Um, as I said, this allows us to use this biometric with as many different places as I want, and this is reuse in the strong sense. Everybody I enroll with can get together and try and learn about me, and they still can't break into one more account that I have, okay? So this is much stronger security than, than we get with um, passwords right now. Um, but it, it also, the way we build these combination locks is uniquely suited to, to have a multi-factor system. So biometrics and, and passwords right now don't play well together in terms of actual security analysis, and this system does. So with a, a, a password incorporated, we can, we can get some really strong security that makes this viable for a, a lot of different applications. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and take questions. Hi, so I know you glossed over a lot of details with the combination lock stuff, yeah. but um, I'm trying to understand what happens, why, if I can like scan somebody's eyes and I have a high quality scan, can I get their key? Uh, yes. So, if, if, so how is it like multiple, how is it, how, you know, I guess like that's not super secure in a lot of ways, right? Because all I have to do is get somebody to like do an iris scan and then, then if I, if I, I can to all ask that. somebody to tell me their password and they do, I can get right. their password. No, like any biometrics is never going to be secure against me measuring the thing and then doing whatever with it because now the, the value isn't private. So, right. A biometric authentication system is not going to be appropriate for every use case. You probably don't want, let's say, the, the president to have facial geometry being used to unlock their phone because there are millions of pictures being taken of the president, right? Like, um, so it is worth noting that the way we derive these, these iris images is from a near IR camera. It is independent from what you actually see about an iris in visible light. So you need to actually be very close to collect this kind of data. But your, your high level point that biometrics make no sense if I can collect the thing. Fingerprints I leave all over the place, right? A picture of my face is online. I think there's a company for it. Oh yeah, Facebook, right? Like everybody has pictures of their face online. I was actually thinking about like one-time pads, and so some of the perfect, you know, if you if you look at the pure, you know, some of the best crypto is if a one-time pad. And so when you're reusing something like an iris that isn't necessarily a one-time input or a key, and then you're generating a mathematical represent, re, representation through a crypto function. And then afterwards, now you're kind of boiling down that mathematical, mathematical representation because now you have this sensory input that you have to account for. What are the chances of downstream collisions, especially with the advent of, you know, we just talked about crypto uh, quantum computing and, and having, you know, artificially manufactured collisions that could then create a, a kind of like another key that would artificially authenticate? Sure. So that, that's what this lower, this 47 bits of security is measuring. That's measuring I don't want to, it's not quite the, the one-time pad strength, but it's close. Um, we actually have some results that show um, this worry about using one-time pad, which is an information theoretic type of crypto, can't work for this problem. Um, the, this ability to, to reuse a biometric in multiple places, the noise present in it keeps a one-time pad or one that corrects noise just can't work. So these combination locks that I completely glossed over are computational and, and that's necessary for, for this to work. But yeah, like we've, we've thought about how much security you actually get with all of them together.
So when we're talking about reliance on physical traits uh, of biometrics for access, and I guess there's a, quite a few applications where you're quick access in multiple scenarios would be important where we'd want to use them, but then we run into the issue, let's say, you're at a nuclear plant, your job is emergency maintenance, you need quick, you, you need quick access in any situation, but you played squash the previous day, you forgot your safety glasses and you're missing one of your eyes, or both, mm -hmm. but you still have the knowledge and so you need it. This is an extreme scenario, I realize, but in any physical trait, your fingerprints can change. Your eyes with minor injuries can still change. That happened to people. So as we rely upon these, does that make some issues where there is a much more significant risk of losing access, at least temporarily, till you can verify who you are, than um, with a password, some knowledge-based, or other forms of verification? Okay, so I, I agree with you this is an issue. I believe it's an issue for every form of authentication that we know about. Maybe I forgot my phone today. Maybe I'm in another country where I don't have cell service. Maybe I have a hangover and I have a poor memory that day. Like, like this issue of we're measuring part of me. If that part of me, whether, whether you're talking about passwords or anything else, we're trying to measure me to authenticate. If I fundamentally change, that's an issue. Like, and this is something that absolutely has to be engineered well. You have to understand how often this happens. But every authentication system has this problem. So I'm very interested in the usability and acceptability of this because one of the issues that we have found, first of all, is that it's very difficult to communicate value. Um, we, uh, there are a lot of two-factor studies where people are like, well, my password is tote secure. Um, the ri aligning risk perception with reality of risk is, is very difficult, so I'd love to hear what you have to say about um, acceptability compared to fingers, because fingers, you know, I mean, we definitely put our fingers places we would not put our eyeballs. And, <laughs> sorry, that came out wrong. And we just ignore that. Uh, people are less sensitive about their digits. Also, in terms of a nuclear plant, I mean, I was in charge of in-core thermocouples was my first job. And at any given point, somebody is suited up and um, ready to respond without authentication. So if you have something that critical, there were always engineers and techs. You know, we all had the respirator and the white outfit. So um, I, I, don't, I don't think that that's a good emergency use case. But could you address usability without saying anything ridiculous like I just did? <laughs> um. So I, I think there's, I, I think a lot of people when they think of iris authentication, they think of like, I put my, my face up to this thing. Samsung Galaxy 8 does iris authentication with you doing it here, right? Like that's the, the same way the iPhone's planning to do facial recognition, so you put your phone here. Like, Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is that Samsung's already deployed this, right? Like, they, they have found that this isn't an issue for users. They, Samsung has, they are doing fingerprint, facial geometry, iris, and password. And they give users the option to do this. Um, so, like, they have, I believe they have the largest share outside the U.S. Like, they feel pretty confident in it. And I think they know more about usability than I do. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I don't think they would have put it on their top end product if they didn't think it was viable. Yeah, I, it's a good question. I'm like way past it. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. <laughs>